Now to our presentation. Today, uh, <clears throat> the uh, second day in June, brings a very special speaker to BVRC. Emergency and public service communications will be in the spotlight for this month's meeting as ARRL Arkansas Section Emergency Coordinator J.M. Rowe and 5XFW will be our guest speaker. J.M. resides in Royal Arkansas, just west of Hot Springs. J.M. is a retired paramedic. He started in public safety as a volunteer firefighter, which led to EMT school, which led to paramedic school. During this time, he got involved in emergency management, which allows him to serve with the Arkansas Division of Emergency Man Management. He is responsible for all the state auxiliary communications efforts. He has served as Arkansas Emergency Coordinator for several years and has developed a very concise and coordinated state structure for all district emergency coordinators and assistant emergency coordinators throughout the state. JAM's main mission is coming to us in coming to us is to explain the importance of emergency and public service communications to encourage our members interested in MCOM and also to help rejuvenate the BVRC MCOM program. JM is married to Debbie, KD5 UPS, who is a retired UPS command pilot. When they are not RVing, JM can be found on the radio enjoying our hobby. Field Day is on the BVRC schedule for the last weekend of June, with Field Day's main objective being the learning and practicing of setting up a portable station, which could be used in an emergency situation, as well as improving operating skills. What better time could we have JM visit us with his emergency communications presentation than now? I want to welcome JM. We had dinner, a few of us had dinner with JM, and uh, a brilliant man and passionate about emergency communications. And so, a big Bella Vista Radio Club welcome to JM. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gosh, uh, I can only hope I can kind of live up to part of that. Uh, uh, you know, I was the section manager here in Arkansas for several years uh, after David Norris uh, got elevated to the district, dist, uh, the uh, division director uh, job, and um, he roped me into doing it. And then my wife said, "You need to quit that." <laughs> and so uh, after after that was over with, the next guy came in as a section manager, and he was not interested in emergency communications at all. And so as a result, for probably, what, 12, 10, 12 years, we just have not had any sort of uh, emergency communications uh, emphasis on amateur radio in Arkansas. And it was, uh, uh, it killed my soul. And so uh, when uh, Jay Ferguson got elected in 5LKE, he asked me to come back and help him. And I told him no, because my wife, my wife said, you, you better not do that anymore. And uh, um, it took, uh, I guess, a couple of years. And she said, I am tired of you moping around. <laughs> Please go help him. And so that's why, that's why I'm here today, is that uh, I, I told him at the Mena Ham Fest that I would be the section emergency coordinator, but he had to let me do it. And he says, oh, let me get out of the way. <laughs> and so here we are. And I hope that uh, what I tell you today gives you a, a part of the same passion that I have for emergency communications. This has been my life for going on 40 years. Uh, I started uh, <clears throat> doing this in 1980. I was uh, licensed uh, in, in 1991, but the public safety stuff started in 1980. So it's, it's been a long time. I've really enjoyed this. I uh, didn't make a lot of money at it, by the way, but who, who does in that service? So here we go. Now what I want you to do <clears throat> is, uh, you can look at me and say, well, this guy knows what he's doing. He's smart as a whip, but guess what? I can't remember what I said five minutes ago. So if you see something, or if I say something, you want to ask a question about it, you best interrupt me right then. <laughs> Y'all understand that? Is anybody here like that? 
Okay, here we go. My name is J.M. Rowe, uh, N5XFW, and I am the Section Emergency Coordinator. I thought it'd be fun to take you guys down to Little Rock, North Little Rock, to Joe T., uh, not Joe T. Robinson, that's the, the convention center. It's, um, yeah, it's Joe T. Robinson uh, uh, campus. And the, um, uh, on the base there is where the Arkansas Division of Emergency Management, which I'm gonna call ADEM, A-D-E-M is ADEM. And so that doesn't have anything to do with the first guy. This is a, this is a whole other story right here. So Adam, this is what you look at when you when you uh, walk in or drive up into the parking lot. That's the front pine tree. <clears throat> this is where the nerve center of the uh, of Adam is. Is that when you call and want to talk to somebody about hazmat or whatever? Uh, there's two people there there's only one on duty right this minute because the other one caught the other one going to the restroom while i was taking pictures um, they can listen to every a win talk group that there is there's eight separate positions in that room that can be staffed with operators should they need to they will have the capability when the next generation 911 comes on of uh, taking over anybody's 911 center, by the way. That, that is in the plans. I don't know how far down the road it is, but that's something that they've talked about for years and years, and hopefully they can make that happen. Because things happen every now and again. We got called to the Pocahontas flood because water was gonna come into their 911 center. They knew it was gonna happen. Why did they build it down there? Nobody knows yet. <laughs> this is the second time. Why did they do that? I don't know. <clears throat> we helped them put everything up on blocks but then nobody wanted to wade in it while the electricity, you know, so I don't, anyway. <clears throat> this is the other side. This is the same person, but her backside. <laughs> and so you can see on the, on the right hand side uh, of, of this picture right here, this is, they, they communicate with Arkansas Nuclear One. Anything goes wrong at Nuclear One, this turns red instead of it being green, <laughs> it turns red. You don't want to be there if it turns red. And so, uh, they do those drills every now and again to make sure that everything is like they want it to be. And uh, it's an it's a interesting time when they do exercises. So here's a little radio stuff right here. <clears throat> this is inside that office. And what you're looking at right there, that box on the left on the shelf, is called FNARS. It's Federal something radio system. I don't know. It's FEMA, FEMA makes this stuff up. It's a uh, ALE capable radio that Adam is able to talk to any of the regions. As a matter of fact, we can talk to every region in the United States uh, with that radio because it sounds, uh, it does its thing, you know, doing the automatic link establishment. And uh, then it, that screen comes up and says, okay, if you want to talk to Alaska, this is the channel you go to. Not that we're ever going to talk to Alaska, but it's good to know, I guess. I don't know. So there, there's that. I'll, there's another picture of the, this is just the head of the radio. The radio itself is 250 yards away. I'll show you a picture of it in just a minute. This is the Emergency Operations Center. <clears throat> you guys maybe haven't seen some locally that might not be as big. I think this thing seats 65 people. Um, they, they use what's called an emergency support function uh, model for their, for their people. So ESF-1 does something. ES, I don't know what they do. ESF-2 is communications, and that's who I am responsible to. Uh, and my job in that situation is if they have some sort of a problem, I'm to find a way around it. That's my job, Tim, is to figure something out that we'll be able to talk and communicate and get some information in and out of a community, wherever it is, in some way, whether it, we got to hire runners or carrier pigeons or what. If the commercial stuff breaks, it's my job to do something about it. So that's what I do. This is from the uh, front looking to the back, so you can see how big it is. On the left-hand side, those windows above are the director's office. The center is the governor's conference room where he would be in case of bad news. And on the right hand side is the governor's office if he has to relocate or she 
uh, that's, that's where they would relocate. This is, that's what the front looks like. They have three big screens. They're as big as this. They, that really not, it's 50 feet across. And so they can display anything that's on a computer on either one of those, all, all those three screens. And uh, it's very entertaining. I'm gonna show you a picture here in a little bit of uh, uh, the exercise that we did uh, uh, day before yesterday and yesterday with FEMA exercise that uh, is, will be one of the displays up there. It's gonna be devoted to ham radio. I think this is just the slickest thing since, I mean, ever. It's just wonderful. <clears throat> And there's a clock case. They do use Zulu time there. Um, I, I thought that was interesting. When you, when you talk to those guys, some of them know what Zulu time is. Some of them call it Greenwich Mean Time. Some of them talk, call it, uh, I don't know what that is. So uh, it's always interesting to visit with them about that. So out the back of that building is our buildings. And you can see that while this is not a good picture, it's not close enough, I wanted to be able to get the there's three towers right there if you can see them uh, and we there's four towers there I'm sorry and we are on three of those towers that's how much money they have invested with us uh, in that they believe that amateur radio is important and uh, it has been since I started working with them more than 40 years ago um, and they have continued that today they have built us and they put us an entire building out there the closest building you can see is actually uh, the, where one of the two A-Win zone controllers is. This, that's the, the south zone controller, I think, is, is in the north zone. Doesn't make any sense, but that's the way Motorola does business. So uh, that uh, dish that you see shoots to Chenal Mountain, which is a big hub for A-Win. And uh, uh, everything is controlled there. So when you key up with your A-Win radio up here, you talk, it goes to the tower, then it gets on microwave, and it goes to a zone controller, comes back to that tower that you were talking on, back to your radio. And that's how every piece of, uh, everything is packetized, and it's all digital and uh, trunked. And so it just happens that Arkansas has one of the most advanced systems in the United States right now is because we started very early. Uh, and we've continued an upgrade. We're in the middle of a $15 million upgrade right now. Um, and it's, uh, it's coming on. We're going from, um, help me Tim, make sure I don't get this wrong. We're going from FDMA, which was frequency, domain, domain multiple, multiple access, to TDMA, which is time division, multiple access. And what that means is we'll be able to fit twice as many radios we call them subscribers, be able to fit twice as many subscribers into the same amount of bandwidth because there's a, a time slot one and a time slot two. And instead of taking up 12 and a half kilohertz to talk, each one takes only 6.25. And so these two guys can talk at the same time because their radios are so precise that they, they can time that millisecond spot. Yes, sir. That Similar, or is it actually DMR? DMR is the same thing as Moto Turbo, mm -hmm. and it is very close to that, but different. Okay. It's the same thing, but different. Same concept. <laughs> yeah, it is exactly the same concept. That's exactly right. <laughs> Glad you said that. That's important too. Once, you, and that was one of the things that that was one of the reasons I was able to pick up and understand DMR is because I'd been working with this stuff for so long that oh well, second nature. It's easy enough. So this is the, what we call the Racy's building. And in Arkansas, Racy's and Aries uh, people all wear the same hat, right? It may have two bills on it, who you're working for, but it's the same hat. Uh, <clears throat> we make no distinctions between the two. And we don't care, free, free, uh, frankly, what you do or who you work for. If you're good enough for them, you're good enough for us. And that's all there is to that. So as you can see, <clears throat> we have our own generator. Uh, we're good to run for a smooth week on that thing right there without refueling. Uh, that's if the big generator that's in the, that runs the building also runs the entire campus. 
it's good for 30 days on the, the uh, amount of fuel that they keep. So if at the end of 30 days, if they've not refueled, we'll turn our generator on and run for another week. And if inside that five weeks we can't get some gas, ah, hell, we're all going home anyway. So that's the end of that. We're running wire antennas. It's really difficult to see, but, the, but there's that tower behind us is the center of two of them. <clears throat> this, this is the, uh, the station down there. The ham side of it is uh, call sign is KB5LZK. If you've been around a little bit and doing radar and what have you, you know that that radar down there is, is LZK. And so we thought that was just real cool that one of the director, well, the director of information technology when I started, uh, his name was uh, David Huddleston, and his call was KB5LZK. And he passed away, it was a tragic thing, he died of cancer, and it took him a long time to die. And we were all <clears throat> just torn up by this. And when we got the opportunity, and his wife agreed that we could have his call sign, so that it is the KB5LZK Memorial Station at Adam. Now, uh, you can see that stack back there in the back, and that is running um, the Windlink Station. Uh, it has uh, two meter, 440, six meter, and HF capabilities all at one time right there. It does um, Pactor, which is the high dollar modem that nobody wants to buy. Uh, it, it does Vera, which is a software program. It does RDOP, which is a software program. And it does Packet, which you have to have a little modem for that, uh, generally. You can do a, there's a software thing that you can do that as well now. And what we do, what's good about this station is, is that this is where a uh, message comes to to get onto the internet. Our internet is fairly robust because we're, we've got three separate sources of internet that automatically fail over at Adam. Uh, they use the military one first, and then, um, oh, what are the city of, I mean, I'm sorry, the state of Arkansas, DIS, and the one that we don't tell anybody about is the cable company gives it to us for free. So happy days with them. They're probably the most reliable people. Other guys <laughs> fall out all the time. <clears throat> So here, you remember I showed you that uh, head of that radio that was in the resource center right there, and this is uh, the other end of that thing. So we're 250 yards away at this time. It's connected by a fiber, uh, uh, glass fiber pair out there to this thing, and that thing makes 3,000 watts. There's a lot of electricity in that building. And so, it goes to a delta loop antenna that they can talk literally all over the United States with that thing. It's pretty cool. So Adam, uh, like I said, we had a 10 year hiatus, 12 years, whatever it is. Uh, and so when it came around that we were interested in, in emergency communications again, Adam said, please let's sign an MOU and, and get this thing going because we believe in amateur radio. And it had been that uh, uh, myself and another couple of guys were the only people that had anything to do with Adam. And we were there by ourselves. And we told them that we would maintain the capability at Adam just in case somebody in the communities wanted to talk. We might be just talking to ourselves, but we knew that as a, as a, as a ham radio operator, you're obligated to do something for your community. And that's what, how we chose to act is by being available case something went on. So we do that. The guy on the left of that picture right there is your section manager. His name is Jay Ferguson, N5LKE. The guy on the right, uh, the, the lesser bearded one, is uh, named A.J. Gary, and he is the director of uh, Adam. He's a real nice guy. He uh, was a uh, police chief at Conway for a, quite a while before he went and got a real job at, at an airline being their security guy, head security guy. So I uh, admire Gary's, uh, AJ's rather, um, Mr. Gary, uh, his commitment to emergency management. I especially like him because when I talk to him, he says, what, what did you say? And, and it lets me explain it to him. 
he takes time for me to explain to him what it is we want. And just almost every time that we've ever asked for a piece of equipment, it shows up, and which I, I, I just couldn't ask for any better than that. <clears throat> so what is Aries? Everybody knows what Aries is, right? Or not. Amateur Radio Emergency Services. Now, this is administered by the ARRL. Doesn't have anything to do with emergency management. Doesn't have anything to do with the police. Doesn't have anything to do with fire. This is strictly an ARRL program that was started a long time ago, probably back in when it was the Cold War, I think. Some, some of you guys that are have a whiter beard than I have might know the particulars about it, but it just didn't matter to me. What I'm looking for is what's going on today. And we put Aries and Racies together simply because there's not enough of us to do both, either or. I mean, you just can't. They're just not. So we have to go on. Now I want to talk a little bit about the administration here in Arkansas that we have, or that, that our, our precepts and concepts and how we think things are going to go and how, what we know about it. <clears throat> So we, all, we know that all, all incidents and events are local in origin. They start small and get big. Even if it's a tornado, it touches down for just a little bit, then it makes a mess, right? Doesn't matter what it is. If it's a flood, it gets out a little bit and then it gets bigger. It never does happen that something happens all at once. The only thing I can think of would be that's a nuclear weapon, and if that happens, I'm not playing that day anyway. I'm going to be, on, be somewhere else. So the concept is for you to be able to work in a local incident is that you have a relationship with that local emergency manager or that local served agency. And that has to be done ahead of time. Because they're not going to know who you are and they're going to be too busy to make friends when something's going on. So today's the day to start that. If you're not already, it's time to start. The next thing is that we are never in charge. <clears throat> I've heard this 1,045 times from emergency managers that a ham radio guy would show up with a portable radio and a funny looking hat and a bunch of pins or whatever on it. And he'd say, I'm here to save you. <laughs> and, and so uh, we have to remember that we're a support agency, support entity, not in charge. We do what they ask us to do they don't do what we ask them to do, ever, just the way it is. And as soon as you get that through your head, that you're there to help, you're there to serve, our lives be, become easier. And I don't get those phone calls in the afternoon saying, what did you send me? I don't like that, for sure. So, to be an Aries, do you have to be an ARRL member? Not at all. I don't care. I just don't care if you're an ARRL member or not to do this. I want you to be an ARRL member because they take care of our frequencies in front of Congress and they uh, do a lot of good. But for doing emergency management, I don't care if you're a member or not, unless you want to be in a leadership role. If you want to be the EC, the, the emergency coordinator for a county, which is the title for it, then you need to be an ARRL member. Otherwise, I can't list you on, their, on the paperwork. And it's just strictly a paperwork thing, is all it is. <clears throat> now, what we want to do is help our communities, right? I mean, that's, that's my goal in life, is to help my community be a better place to live and to make things easier and to help. I, I started, started out as a volunteer fireman because the farm next to my dad's place caught on fire they went around and the fire trucks were going by and I went with them. And uh, I whooped on that fire with a wet tow sack. That's what we had for firefighting equipment back in the day. A five gallon bucket of water and a tow sack. Now, we whooped on that fire for about three hours before the Forest Commission came along and got a bulldozer and, and fixed what we had screwed up for, I mean, they did it in an hour, you know, where we'd been out there for three, so. Anyway, that's, uh, <clears throat> that set off a little spark in me that says, yeah, you know what, I can help. I, I'm, I'm a big enough boy that I can do some good in this world. And I think that we're put here on earth to either learn something or to teach something. And if we can do that, if we can learn and teach, 
and do good for our people, that makes us a better person. There you go. So I want you to go build that relationship right now. Who's the emergency manager? What county are we in? We're in Washington County right now, right? Benton. We're in Benton County? Yeah. Who's the emergency manager in Benton County? Is it Robert McGowan? Well, it's embarrassing. We don't know. Oh, you guys, you guys homework assignments, go find that out. Uh, Robert McGowan was the uh, president of the Arkansas Emergency Management Association for a couple of terms because of COVID. He had, to re he had to do it again. And if he's not, then the emergency manager works for him because I think he is the director of public safety. I think the sheriff and the emergency manager work for Robert. So I'm not sure who the emergency manager is. And I know that the 911 coordinator for Benton County has tried to get uh, amateur radio licensing, you know, like John Norman. Yep. She's actively tried to get Hams involved with working the 911. We at Bentonville, let me think about this a minute. Is her name Rania Marvigio? I think so. Rania has had me up teaching class a couple of times, but I teach what's called COML, Communications Unit Leader, which is a professional um, public safety stuff and how to arrange communications at, a, at an incident. And uh, she's talked to me about that a time or two. I didn't have the uh, resources to be able to teach uh, at that time. John Nordland does, uh, works for the health department, does a really good job. You guys will be very happy with him, we I need believe. To remember to tell her yeah. about this upcoming class. Help, help, Absolutely. Help I think she's out. I think if you guys know her, she's, she does a lot of fishing. For whatever reason, her family likes catching spoonbill catfish. <laughs> They're not any good to eat. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> So build a relationship now. Let's start that stuff. Now, it does not have to be emergency management. It can be the Red Cross. It could be the Salvation Army. In Oklahoma, the Salvation Army is a really big deal. I don't see it so much here in Arkansas. There's a lot of places that could utilize amateur radio communications. So don't think it has to be, you know, all emergency management. Not at all. I'm going to say emergency management. But that, that's a generic term for wh whoever your served agency is. Now, the second thing you need to do is be trained to whatever level satisfies the needs of your served agency. Now, uh, and whatever it is that they want, that's what you should do. Because you don't want them trying to step back to, to fit you. There is a story that uh, I read uh, here a couple of days ago. How wide's up? home plate. Anybody know? How wide is it? Come on. 17 inches. How wide is it in how wide is home plate in Little League? 17 inches. How wide is it in high school? 17 inches. How wide is it in semi-pro? 17 inches. How big is it in the big leagues? 17 inches. Now, we've got a pitcher. He's a great guy, but he can't get it over the plate. Now, do we, do we say, Jimmy, we're gonna, we, we love you. We're going to widen that plate a little bit. We'll make it 18 inches. You still can't do it? No problem. How about 20? How about 25? Do we do that? No. Where do we send Jimmy? He goes to the little leagues, right? He goes to Pocatello. And so what I want to impress upon you guys is that it's up to us to be accountable. We want to do what it is that needs to be done to get the pitch over the plate at 17 inches. I want you guys to hold your home plate at 17 inches. There, that's all I got to say about that. I think that's a, that's a seriously good story. It was on Facebook. Uh, I just happened to see it, and I think uh, that really hit home. It hit home with me. So there you go. Number three is be respectful. <clears throat> the, the guys that come along and say, I'm, I've got a radio that makes me in charge. I'm going to be passing orders to everybody, what have you. That's the guy that gets shown the door first. So we just want to do that. You want to be very, very respectful, if at all possible. Uh, I'm not telling you to kiss anybody's foot. 
But at the same time, remember that guy's in charge and you're a volunteer. And so you got to, if you want to do the job, you got to be respectful. And that's all, all you got to do. And the fourth thing is while you're building that relationship with that served agency, you want to make yourself useful in other areas. I've carried trash out before, you know, uh, when we were up at uh, um, Pocahontas, I went and bought uh, gasoline for the generators. It's just, you can do what it is that you can do to make yourself useful so that when something happens, they'll say, let's get JM because we know that he'll work. He, he likes doing this stuff. We want him. And so that's what you do. Now the training that I'm going to suggest to you tonight is a baseline is the incident management classes. These are all available online, every one of them, 100, 200, 700, and 800. Each one of those classes takes two hours or less for you to do. Now, the uh, real live, th they say it's going to take three hours. You can do it in two hours if you're thinking about it. If you're doing it in three hours, then that's okay too. Now, to, to get to those classes, you go to the FEMA Online Learning Center. And if you, uh, if you Google FEMA classes, you'll come to that. They make you register now. You get a student ID number, and mine is uh, 0422396. I have taken almost every one of those classes, so I remember that number. Can't remember what my phone number was, or is, but I can remember that. <clears throat> The ARRL also has an emergency communications training course that will help you to become familiar with handling traffic, which is a different thing. and It's a skill that has to be learned. It's not something you just know. Uh, handling messages uh, back in the good old days when, when uh, we had big traffic nets and, and uh, messages moved from one side of the country to the other and then back and then north and south, what we did was we prided ourselves on the exact word count of the original message was the very same word count as it was when it got to the end, when it got to, to when it was delivered. And so that skill has kind of sort of been lost uh, or not in use today. And uh, that's something that uh, we're telling people, if you get the gist of the message, that's probably as good as we're going to get. Uh, I know that in working in that EOC there at Adam, that a lot of times they say, well, what did he mean? And we say, well, I didn't hear the tone of his voice. You know, I'm looking at a written thing here. Uh, and that's it. So, so when you get a message, you have to look at it and make sure that you got the meaning of the, of the uh, message. Everybody good with that? <clears throat> JM, I don't want to do these stupid FEMA courses. Just doesn't have anything to do with me. I'm not interested in that. I said, oh, I don't, I, like I told you earlier, I don't care. We can use you for something else. If you don't want to be involved with the county emergency manager, and here's why. It's all about money for him. Do you know this? Have you ever heard of the Stafford Act? Who's heard of the Stafford Act? It's one, two, three, four, not very many. The Stafford Act says that to take money, well, you, you guys have heard that FEMA gives money out after a disaster, right? Everybody's heard that. How do they base that money? They base the money on the amount of damage that's done, right? They say, we're going to pay 75%, whatever it is. And so the county's got to come up with the other dollar amount. And so to receive that money, the emergency manager and the county judge have to sign a piece of paper that says their organizations are NIMS compliant, National Incident Management System. That means that everybody has to have at least those four courses. Even the guys running a chainsaw, even the guys running a bulldozer, they all have to have that. And I have seen there, there is a county in Tennessee that is much poorer now because FEMA did not award them money because they didn't have more than half of their people. They couldn't document that more than half their people were NIMS compliant. And so we don't want to do that. There's not an emergency manager in the United States that I know of that would appreciate getting his money taken away from him in, in the event of a disaster.
Now, there's tornadoes happen in Benton County, don't they? And so we don't we don't want to be the cause of the county losing money. I know there's more money than you can shake a stick at in, in Benton County. I mean, Uncle Sam, all he's got to do is just write a check for it, right? Or Aunt Alice. It just, but that ain't gonna work. So don't be the reason that we have a problem. Just take those classes. But if you don't want to take those classes, I still want to use you for situational awareness. Okay? I want to know, did you see the tornado go through your neighborhood? I want to know, is the trees down across your road? I want to know if the house next door has got injured people trapped in it. You can still be useful. <clears throat> now, larger uh, events are going to require relaying messages from inside the affected area to outside the affected area. And uh, we use a hub and spoke arrangement for that. So the spokes can be anybody that's in the uh, area, in the affected area, and then out. Back to the hub, which is like the EOCs uh, and the, the, where the, the command posts are, that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a hub and spoke arrangement. Um, and I have to tell you that without the spokes, the wheels don't go round and round, just the way it is. And so everybody's going to be important when something goes on that they need us. Um, and if you don't want to take those classes, you can still be a spoke. I don't care. They asked me, uh, we, had this, uh, we had an exercise last month at Adam where one of the focuses was communications and communications outages. And they asked me, how are we going to verify who it is that you're talking to on the other end? See, White County, the guy in White County calls and says, well, I need five ambulances. And so the EOC said, well, how do we know that that's real? And so one of the oldest employees, oldest, the longest time employees said, look, if it gets down to where we're using ham radio operators, it's going to be a real deal. Who do you, what do you think? They ran in a, ran in a Chinese subversive into White County <laughs> that's going to need five ambulances. Come on. And so, okay, that makes sense to everybody. Huh. So let's talk about situational awareness here just a little bit. You know, the emergency manager wants to know a lot of information because he's got to make a bunch of decisions. Or when I say he, I mean she and all. Help me, please. Uh, inclusive. Yeah, that's my big word. Um, we want to know about current weather. We want to know about current uh, power outages. Uh, road closures are a really big deal. Floods. You guys have a lot of flood stuff up here in this part of the world. Flash floods up and down. When's the road covered? When did it get uh, clear again? Whether the, you've got uh, utility damages or outages, you know, the, what, is the water out? That was one of the questions that was asked in the, the uh, exercise here, the 31st and 1st. And uh, of course, damages, uh, property damage and injury reports is always a good thing as well. The emergency manager in your county wants to know that because that depend, having that information helps him to decide what it is that he needs to tell Little Rock about getting some help up up here. So how are you going to provide that situational awareness? Well, this again is the hub and spoke stuff. Voice nets can uh, be done on two meters or 440, for instance, to come to somebody that's going to do HF that can talk to Little Rock. Now, I'm, uh, this is just a huge, big overview kind of thing. It could be that, it, that the information stops in Bentonville or in Fayetteville or wherever it needs to stop. It, so it could all be done on two meters and 440. And that, so that means that technicians are very valuable. They're the gathering point generally for information. And then the, the generals and extras are gonna pass it on. They're important as well, but one general needs to, can take care of 15 technicians, you know? And so that's, that's an important thing to do. Now I wanna talk about Windlink for a minute. This past uh, um, couple of days have been very uh, exciting 
for us people, us people. Sound like I'm from rural Arkansas, don't I? Um, um, I'm, I'm from Bar Creek. <laughs> Where y'all from? Y'all from away? Anyway, Winlink messages, uh, they've, they've got a, uh, a fairly new uh, capability in Winlink that you put your latitude and longitude where you are in the thing, or you just put your grid square and it decides what your latitude and longitude is. And then when you send a, one of these messages to the served agency, all of a sudden we can put that on a map now. That's the slickest thing since ever. I, I know I said that a while ago, but this is even slicker. Uh, it, it, it just, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> but I decided not to. <clears throat> anyway, it supports uh, geographical information services. Uh, and it's it just, it's a wonderful thing. So what's our long-term goals? We have, we're, we're starting from scratch here in Arkansas. Y'all are the first group I've come to talk to since I've been appointed as a section emergency coordinator. Thank you for letting me be up here. I mean, no kidding, thanks a lot. Uh, this means a lot. I appreciate uh, the leadership of this club. I appreciate the uh, Alita for providing the uh, space and allowing they didn't, they didn't run me an ACIC or I wouldn't be up here, I'd think. Um, the, uh, and I appreciate each and every one of you guys showing up. Uh, you could have said, oh, hell, I know him. I'm not coming up here, but you didn't. <laughs> and I appreciate it. So uh, what we our long-term goals that we're starting is sustainable training programs filled with new guys. And almost everybody, because we've had such a long hiatus, Almost everybody's a new guy in, in Aries and Races now. It uh, doesn't matter how old they are. So I think that's a great thing. I'd love to have newer hams, though, simply because if we train them like we want them and raise them up right, they'll do good in the future. That's what I think, Don. I mean, that just makes sense to me. If you raise a kid up right, then he's going to do good and you can be proud of him instead of like some kids that I know that, yeah, their dad's not too proud of them right now, too much. Do y'all, some of you guys will remember that the, there was an Arkansas packet network. We had it on two meters that was the user frequencies and then it went to a six meter backbone and eventually it would get to the internet somewhere and you could send a message back and forth or it could go over radio. And so we're hoping to augment that with uh, Vera Vera, and I can't, I don't have any idea what that uh, Vera stands for, but it's a, it's a mode of uh, a software mode. How's it spelled? V-A-R-A. I think you're going to find it's uh, German. And I can't pronounce it anyway. So the next thing is, and this is something that's been unusual. Uh, <clears throat> we've heard all our lives that we don't care what happens next door. And all of a sudden, I do care what happens next door. And I will be my brother's keeper. So, so systems that I build here in Arkansas uh, are, are, are for our neighbors. The Windlink system that we build, Arkansas people don't use that because they're too close to it. You know who uses our Windlink station more than anybody else when they have a hurricane? Puerto Rico we get a special temporary authorization from the federal government, from the FCC, uh, to run up to PAC door four, and they can, which is really high speed stuff. They can use PAC door four in uh, Puerto Rico because of the hurricane, and we pass no telling how many messages, it just happens we're just the right distance for them to use it on 40 meters. And it happens all the time when they have a problem down there. And they're still having problems today, they don't have their stuff fixed yet. <clears throat> I don't know that they ever will. They just, money keeps falling into the creek. I don't know what happens. So one of the, here's, here's the, this is not the slide I'm excited about the most, but this is one of the most important slides here, is that I can't solve a problem if I don't know about it. 
just the way it is. I want to solve problems. I want to make things easy for you. But that 100% down there at the bottom, problems known to staff. Now, this is not my slide. I lifted it out of a magazine somewhere, so it's a pitiful, pitiful picture, but it's the best I could do. You understand the slide? Mm -hmm. You see that an iceberg, there's a lot of it underwater, and there's a lot that the guys can solve problems just don't know about. And so everybody at the end of this presentation is going to have my email address, uh, and I look at it. I carry a, a, an iPhone that gets every email. Uh, I have a computer that gets every email. I have two iPads that gets every email, and I look at them all. That's what I, that's what I do. My wife cooks, and I look at emails. Uh, and I, well, I eat too. <laughs> she wants to feel appreciated. So that's what I do. <clears throat> and so this is a serious, serious thing. If you don't take anything else away tonight, look at that. That ought to apply to your to your day-to-day -day living, as a matter of fact. I, I found that slide just terribly uh, right on a button. Big corporations. Yeah, that absolutely. Well, you know, I see this, uh, Tim, and I bet you'll, I bet you're going to say, "Jam, you're 100 percent right." Having worked for the state of Arkansas, I worked for the health department a little while. I built their emergency operations center, designed the RF stuff for their sit for their uh, emergency operations center. When I would go tell my little boss, "We've got a problem. This is wrong." Well, in two or three weeks, the director would come down. He'd say, well, what's the problem? You know, what's going on? And I'd say, well, uh, I reported that da-da-da-da. Uh, and he'd say, well, I didn't know about it. Then a little while, I learned to go straight to Dr. Halverson and talk to him. Now, I chapped everybody, all four layers in between me and him. But you know what? We got stuff done. We got that thing built. And it works good. And the rest of those goobers don't work at the health department anymore. <laughs> now this slide I am excited about. <clears throat> this was the results. This is the results of the exercise uh, that took place May 31, June the 1st. The scenario was, can you see four? Now you can't see four red patches. Miami's off the, off the picture down here. Miami, Charleston. That's not Charleston. What is that? Raleigh, rather? Raleigh. Raleigh. Raleigh yeah. Little Rock and Dallas all had a cyber attack that killed all communications in and out of each city. What are we going to do? Now, this is a federal thing. Ham radio was an afterthought. We asked, could we just piggyback onto that and, you know, play? Actually, we were playing with ourselves, as a matter of fact, because no, no, no FEMA intervention whatsoever. We just played. So um, every one of those dots probably has more dots under it. For instance, here, Little Rock, that dot right there is 11 different individuals reporting. These polygons that you see right here, we added them in because that's what the National Weather Service in Little Rock, that was the only polygons they had going on. Those are river flooding stuff. We were hoping that that day there'd be some severe weather stuff, but no, thank God it was a clear day. You know, we don't get what we want all the time, but here we are. In any case, <clears throat> a thousand reports, almost a thousand reports. Now, how can FEMA look at that number and not say, good night, ham radio's busy. There's somebody we might pay attention to if there's nothing else, situational awareness. Every one of these is what was called a situation report on the ground, and the questions asked are, is your power on, is your water on, is your TV working, is the AM, FM radio stations working, what else? Are streets blocked, you know, just whatever, whatever the questions were. And it was all geocoded because it came from Windlink. WinLink was the only thing we only mode that we used, didn't do any voice stuff at all. And what you're looking at this program right here is 
our man Josh Joshua Carroll, AA5JC. He's a young guy, lives there in Little Rock. Developed the program to put these dots and their respective reports on Google Earth. Now FEMA is using a program called ArcGIS. Y'all familiar with that? ArcGIS, what, is that free? Oh, hell no, it ain't free. I'm telling you, ArcGIS is probably one of the most expensive things that you can come across that the government uses. Now, I guess that's why the government uses it. Nobody else uses it. Google Earth is free. The program he built is free. We are going to be integrating this. I don't know exactly how we're going to do it yet, but it's exciting that <laughs> we get to think about the opportunity of building this. Look at the information that your emergency manager can get. Situational awareness. Can he see where there's a problem? Look at those red dots. That's a problem, isn't it? There's a problem right there in Little Rock, downtown Little Rock. And Dallas, oh my goodness. It's just something that... Sorry, I usually don't do this, but I just got a bit confused. So is this real numbers? Yeah. Like no, this is real. And this is, you said, reports from Android operators? Yes, okay. absolutely. This happened over the 24-hour period from 5 o'clock Friday afternoon to 5 o'clock, I'm sorry, day before yesterday. What day is today? Somebody help me. So May the 31st, 5 o'clock in the afternoon to 5 o'clock on the 1st. Was this a scheduled, simulated? Yeah. Exercise? Okay. You didn't really have massive... No, we, this, this is an exercise. Okay. Yep. We publicized it. I put it out on the section manager email list. Some of you may have seen it. Um, and one of the goals was, one of the tests for, that FEMA tasked is, how many hams can we get this to? They did not understand that hams are, while they're not self-deploying, we don't self-deploy, right? But we are self-aware. And if something's going on, we can always provide situational awareness from our house, which is what all this is. J.M., do you think you'll do this again in the near future? This particular exercise? Yeah. I don't know. Because <clears throat> um, we hadn't even had a hot wash yet, Tim. Most people up here don't know what Winlink is. Yeah. Well, Winlink is, is a cool program in that you can use it over two meters. You can use it on whatever, whatever infrastructure you have, whether it's HF, whether it's two meters whether it, you don't have any radio, you don't have to hook it to a radio, you can do what's called telnet, where you put your uh, imp information in and your uh, report, pull the trigger, and it goes to what's called central message service, services, and um, those CMSs are on Amazon. Used to, they had seven, this is a worldwide system by the way, they had seven servers scattered all over the world, all over the surface of the world. And they have quit that and gone to Amazon and distributed computer systems, and the thing just does not go down now. As long as Amazon doesn't go down, it's not going to go down. And uh, what's his name? Um, Bezos is not interested in Amazon going down. So they're pretty, they're pretty good about being reliable. And so as long as that's good, we're good. So we're, we're very happy with that. There's, I don't know how many different uh, receiving stations there are around the United States, but probably close to 400. And so you, there's one, that KB5LZK that I showed you is one I'm here in Arkansas. There's two more besides that. Is there a need for more uh, HL? I don't think so. The problem, we call them an RMS, radio message server. The problem is, is that there's such a limited number of frequencies for them to use yeah. that what we're doing is getting into a gridlock kind of thing. And what they're doing now is if a message comes to an RMS, we don't have to have it get onto the internet. If that RMS is not on the internet, if it's broke for whatever reason, the RMS will hold the message until the, depending on its settings, until the internet comes back, or it has the capability, each one of these stations has the capability 
of being a mesh network on our on the HF. So think about that. You, everybody, there are a lot of people have got mesh systems, Wi-Fi in their house. This is on HF I didn't know that. instead of 2.4. How cool is that? I mean, it's just. I mean, they broadcast and they say, "I'm here." Uh, this is my. This is how far away I am from you. That's what your signal report is. So it's like ALE, automatic link establishment, except for it's mesh. And they, I, I can guarantee, you by the time you pull the trigger and your message gone, wherever it's going, less than five minutes, six is going to be delivered. Just the way it is, it works. Just and it's just cool, and it's happened inside our lifetime, and it's it the 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 improvements that it, that they make the windlink development team makes just happen at a geometric rate because the more advancements they get the more people are interested the more people that use it the more people that volunteer and think of good stuff this message stuff came from a guy in the uh, red cross and so he says we need message forms bada bing bada bow we've got every ics form in that program now you don't have to remember anything just fill it out how cool is that is there any questions about this yes sir you mentioned the arkansas packet network yep what about the nationwide aprs packet network does it fit in the picture too? not at all and I'll, I'll talk about that aprs uh, gateways now you can do messaging on that but the problem is there's no acknowledgement you don't know for sure that somebody got your message and you can't know if it's not forward error correcting so you don't know and that's the big deal about APRS now you can send messages hither and yon forever and ever amen as long as that server in Finland is up if it breaks then the whole world quits that APRS.fi server and he wants to keep his stuff running because he's He's running ads on that, so to pay for it, <laughs> it's all about money, and so uh, that's important to him. He keeps it up as much as possible. It is not as reliable as this is. That's the deal. We can't trust APRS for MCOM. I'd love to, because everybody's got some, but can't trust it. It's the only thing. Any anybody else? Yes, sir. You guys work with the hurricane nets at all? Yep. 14 points of we listen to those guys. Um, if there's a hurricane down there, they sometimes ask us to monitor that to see if there's any potential impacts that Arkansas, Arkansas is a, uh, all 50 states are, are uh, signors to a program called EMAC, the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. And where if uh, Louisiana needed two dump trucks, they might call Arkansas to get those dump trucks, whatever it is. So we pay attention to that to see if there's a potential need that Arkansas would fill. We, I guess, uh, the, the big deal uh, that I can think of with EMAC is uh, they asked for uh, people to go to N New Mexico two weeks ago for the fires. They were looking for uh, public safety grade uh, repeater installers. And we told them, no, we don't do that. We don't want to do They wanted you to go to Philmont, which is the Boy Scout Ranch, mm -hmm. and they wanted you to be able to work sustained uh, periods of time without support above 12,000 feet. And I said, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> I, can't get, I can't get all this up 12,000 feet, much less stay up there, for God's sakes. <clears throat> so, uh, the EMAC is a big deal. It's a uh, it's, uh, revolutionized uh, emergency management, the movement of, of uh, mi uh, personnel and material. So there you go. Do you have a question back here? There he is. Yes, sir. The uh, local clubs used to uh, maintain ham equipment in the basement of the courthouse here. We had pack four modem, two HF radios, two dual band radios. We used to, uh, years ago, bring those out once a month at least. Uh, that's fallen in disarray in the last couple of years. Is there any merit at all to uh, try to bring that back? One of, one of the issues is that um, 
at the time, there were no ham radio operators that actually lived down there. It was just the puppies, and so yeah. they had a local puppy operator. Uh, I don't think we ever successfully got an operator down there. But we do have the equipment. We've got that very expensive Pactor modem in there, too. We've got two fine HF radios and two really good fine radios. Currently, we're without an uh, HF antenna. But uh, I'm just not sure if it makes sense to uh, try to bring that back to life. So here you go. This is what I'm thinking, is that that's part of your building your relationship with that emergency manager. Say, look, we know you got some stuff down there. Hadn't seen the light of day for a long time. It may be, especially those modems, if they're uh, SES modems, that when you turn them on, all of a sudden it's going to let the smoke out of something. Because those caps and those things are notorious for drying out, and they just blow up. Now, um, <clears throat> that's a possibility. But if you tell them that, look, we're getting trained, we want to help, point us at it, let us work with you, here's our first project is to get you back on the air, I bet you you will find an uh, open door and maybe a cup of coffee. So I'd say yes. I believe I have pushed for years uh, at the emergency management conferences, and which is going to be back up here this coming year, in Rogers, I guess. Uh, I've spoken for years about the need for emergency managers to own their own ham equipment so that ham radio operators didn't have to unhook from their house and come hook to an antenna that they didn't know about. And if that stuff is in place already, where it will be used, then we can import operators all day long that are not going to take their radio home at the end of the shift, which is bad. You don't want to take your radio home. And then the next guy says, well, I thought there was going to be a radio here for me to use. And that's what I've been encouraged, why I've been encouraging the emergency managers to own their own stuff. So if you can put his stuff back in use, I think that's a great idea. Jay, the, the, the software now that runs that without the motor, is it as good as those old kind of modems like Steve's talking about? Are they so, so Pactor is, Pactor 3 is faster than, there's a paid version of Vera, uh -huh. and it's 25 bucks and you're done. Uh, the, the Pactor modems are 15 to $1,700 a piece. Oh, you still have to have a modem? No, only for, if you're going to do Pactor. Okay. Vera is not as fast, but it's $25. Oh, is it? Pactor is $1,500. Okay, but are they, I hate to be dumb, but are, do they work together? No, they're separate, they're separate things. Okay. You would, in, in WinLink, you decide which one of the various modes you're going to use to send okay. the message. Okay. Does that make Vera, sense? Vera is the one that you use software. Yes, right? yes. Do they get speeds as high as the modems? It's, as, it's, it's faster than Pactor 2. It's not as fast as Pactor 3. Okay. Now, there is a Pactor 4, which currently is not legal to use in amateur radio uh, unless you get a special temporary authority like we get for Puerto Rico. It is legal in Mars and shares. And we run a share station down there as well. We were seriously con uh, concerned for years that MCOM was going to be taken away from amateur radio altogether and given to SHARES, which is, SHARE stands for Shared Resources. You don't have to take another test, but you have to get another license. You have to swear on them, whatever it is that you swear on, and it's a super, it's a super secret squirrel government-run thing that you have to promise to not disclose the frequent they don't name frequencies they call them by they call a frequency a four digit term it's spao is equal to 6910 megahertz <laughs> and so 6.910 rather so um, you, when you, when you're out talking now I see I just made that number up if anybody asked you I made that up right <laughs> what was that you sat right there and let me just 
That's a state secret for you. Oh no, I didn't say that either. <laughs> so in any case, uh, you can you can uh, there. It's a secret thing. It's kind of like the army does with Mars, and uh, it it. Um, it's a nice program to do, and I was very concerned that they were going to shift everything over onto them. And hopefully, through examples like this, we can prevent that because a lot of people want to work. They want to be useful in their community. And so there you go. <clears throat> Here's my contact information. I do have some email addresses there. There's four of them. I don't know why the bottom one turned white, but... Uh, I promise I had nothing to do with it. You didn't hit space after it. Might, oh, is that what it is? Yeah, because if you hit space after it, you yeah. underline it. Oh. So I okay. came all this way to learn that. <laughs> I guess my trip was not wasted. <laughs> huh. That um, Chris will remember that the ARRL.org address was only used for people that were in a leadership position in the ARRL. You had to be a section manager to get that. And uh, thank you, Don. Um, uh, the, um, so because my time as a section manager, they allow me to keep that .org address. And it still works. And it forwards every one of those. Well, the Adam doesn't, it's its own thing. The, the ARRL thing is forward to the Yahoo address because I think the Yahoo is um, <laughs> reliable. <laughs> Sometimes they trip over cords up the ARRL, unplug things, it crap happens, you know. I'm sure you guys remember their website in the last three years being down, up and down, and in and out, couldn't figure out what was going on. So Don handed me a reminder. I, we talked about this at dinner time. He says, what about assistant emergency coordinators and uh, what have you here? So I, I told him, I said, if you'd remind me, I'd talk about it. So here we are. <clears throat> Generally, in, in uh, the, the leadership structure that the ARRL has is that there's a section emergency coordinator, then there's a district emergency coordinator that can have no assistance. He can't have any deputies or anything that then there is the county emergency coordinators and they can have as many uh, assistants as they want to. That assistant emergency coordinator does not have to be a member of the ARRL to be in Aries. So if you guys can find yourself, I don't, I don't know that you have an emergency coordinator here for Benton County. You could pick one, a guy that has a uh, a ARRL membership, and then divvy out uh, the uh, assistant emergency coordinators as you want to. You can have somebody that's in charge of taking care of the emergency manager, somebody that's in charge of working with the Red Cross, somebody that's in charge of extorting money from Walmart, some, and on and on and on. Uh, just ever how you want to go about that. I think uh, that uh, that kind of thing, spreading the wealth as it were, so that one person is not trying to shoulder the entire burden is a, is a huge benefit. We're also looking for district emergency coordinators. Um, and what the deal is there uh, in Arkansas is that we found that because he can't have an, an assistant, several of the guys that were in place that have been there for a long time, placeholders because there wasn't anything going on, said, I can't do all this by myself because I'm old. I probably need to retire. I need an assistant. We didn't have any way to appoint an assistant for them. So I promoted all of them. I gave them a, a double their pay uh, and made them all assistant section emergency coordinators. And then as their assistant, they can appoint a, a district emergency coordinator. And so they can, they can screw with me but I'm gonna find a way around them. <laughs> and so that's what, that's what we did. Uh, and I think that that works. So if you're interested in a, in a leadership position, if you think that you wanna do something in Aries, I wanna to talk to you. I wanna make you successful. It's my job to make you successful. And that will mean that I've done my part toward making Arkansas a better place. And that is my goal. 
Thank you very much for having me. Any questions? JM, we have, I just wanted you to know, we have a unique animal here with this radio club. You are a few hundred feet from the Washington Benton County line right here where Alita is located. That's 90% of the Northwest Arkansas population. And I'm not sure about tonight's crowd, but in BBRC, you have the most regional radio club in Northwest Arkansas, Southwest Missouri, and Northeast Oklahoma. You have three states, uh, three, three outside of Arkansas counties, two in Southwest Missouri, one Northeast Oklahoma, of which I know you have no responsibility, and four counties here in Northwest Arkansas. Um, so for us to coordinate all of this is going to be a challenge. I'm here to help. I can do it. I know everybody um, in o uh, Oklahoma and in, in Missouri. And whatever challenges you guys face, I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to help. I mean, if it requires going and beating somebody up or something, I know guys for that too. <laughs> uh, we can we can get her done. And by the way, Bob Idaker told me to tell you hello. Um, another former. Another former. Yep, he was one of my mentors uh, when uh, when I got to be the section manager. He took me aside and he says, the first thing you do as a section manager is if they invite you to go eat, go. <laughs> and I took that to heart. And <laughs> you can see, I'm still, de still doing it. <clears throat> there, yes, sir, Don? Uh, JM, concerning the ARRL annual set, simulation, simulated emergency test, uh, how do you handle the participation of Arkansas hands in that? And who would, if any of us wanted to, or, or either individually or collectively as a club, participate in that annual event, uh, how would we go about that? So what, what we do is that's typically on a county level. And uh, what you do is just treat that as a, as a net. And when you're the emergency coordinator for the county, one of the things that you do is report your activity up to the section. And we report that to the ARRL. I just almost forgot to tell you something, Dad. Gum import. Thank you for that. Uh, I just need to stop and do this before I forget about it. We talked about the Stafford Act a while ago. If the county has a 50% match with the federal government, how do they make up that 50%? Do they, does it have to be money? In kind work. In kind work. Guess what? Every hour that you spend is at a rate that's determined by FEMA, which I think is in the neighborhood of $25 an hour right now, which is more than a dump truck driver, more than a heavy equipment operator, way more than a chainsaw operator does. One of the things that we do is, that's the reason we report every hour to the ARRL, even if it's not an emergency, is because we want to show the FCC and other government agencies, the Forest Service is another one, that we do put in a lot of volunteer hours. And this is the amount of money that the federal government says that we're worth. And the more that they can do for us, the more we're gonna do for them. So that amount of money, and it only happens if you report it. You can work like a dog for two weeks and if it didn't, if, it, if the paperwork's not done, it didn't happen, right? I mean, it's just like every other job that you do. It, it ain't over until the paperwork's done. Well, there you go. Where was I before I got distracted? SCT. <clears throat> the SCT, thank you. Uh, the SCT, I told you I was gonna forget, right? Here, then I, there's an example. Uh, the SCT happens once a year. It's at a uh, done at a local level. They never suggest a scenario. So you get to do what it is that you want to do. You can have your emergency manager suggest something for you, or you can tell him that you're doing it. You can show him the number of hours that you contributed to this effort. 
and let him be amazed at that. That's something that he can use in his paperwork that he has to submit to Adam. He's got to do so many exercises every year, and you contributing hours will help him as well. So do it at a county, do it at a local level. Keep track of your number of hours. Report those number of hours up the chain and feel good about yourself. It's my thing. Yes, sir. I got a short story I gotta tell you. Okay. Mr. Breeze is my neighbor. And I told him I was an amateur radio. I am. Yep. He said, What's that? And so we battled back and forth for a few minutes and he said, Oh, you're the guys that help out during emergencies. I thought that was pretty There you go. Everybody knows. They just might have to be led to it. Anybody got anything else? Going once. What, yes, sir. I have a scanner in my handset, and I can hear <coughs> Awin on, and I hear Adam on there talking to units that sign off. Are those uh, state field DCs? They are probably the area coordinators. There's five of those people. Okay. There's the Adam is arranged in northeast, northwest, southwest, southeast, and central. And uh, those, the, the probably who you're hearing, if you're hearing it on Adam uh, 1, uh, or probably not Matt Call, but on Adam 1, those are guys that actually work for Adam, if not a county that's calling in for some, something or another. Sure enough. Going twice. I want y'all to know that I have thoroughly enjoyed this. It was a very long and windy road up here <laughs> when i started driving up here in 1977 it was highway 71 so it is a vast improvement now <laughs> i can tell you that but i want to thank tom i want to thank uh, the rest of you people uh for inviting me and being so gracious and if there is anything that i can do for you uh and and you don't call me it's your fault okay let's remember that iceberg I want to chip away and put all that ice in my iced tea. Okay? Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Don's over there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's an honor to know you. Uh,